Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Before we get started, I'll just uh, give everybody a few reminder housekeeping items. For the premiers at the table, if you wish to speak, you have to press your button for your microphone to work. We uh, have media on the phone line joining us today. If you have a question, please press star one to enter the queue. Everybody on the phone and in the room will be limited to one question. Uh, for, uh, we will start with questions in the room first and on the phone second. Please direct your questions to the Premier that you wish to have a response from and uh, clearly identify yourself and your outlet when you step up to the mic. I will now hand it over to Premier John Horgan. Uh, thank you very much, Lindsay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us here in my hometown, the traditional territory of the lekongan speaking people, the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nation. We've had uh, two and a half days of uh, vigorous discussion about all of the things that bring us together in Canada, as well as the challenges we face uh, region by region, province by province, community by community. It has been uh, an invigorating time when you have uh, 13 Canadians coming from different perspectives, different places, all with a common goal, and that is to lift up the citizens in their communities to ensure that Canadians can have the best possible outcomes during the very challenging times we've all been through. During the COVID-19 pandemic, this group, uh, the C Council of the Federation, met over 40 times as premiers to discuss the challenges we were facing in our communities as a result of a global pandemic. Throughout that time, we met with the federal government 36 times, and the collaboration and cooperation was quite frankly unprecedented in our history, and the outcomes for Canadians were also unprecedented. Although we were uh, facing the same challenges that other communities were around the world, outcomes for Canadians were better because we were working together, using our public health care system to protect and preserve the well-being of our citizens. But now that we're coming out of the pandemic and looking forward, we see more challenges. Climate change, uh, rising uh, cost of living and affordability issues with respect to inflation, as well as a number of other concerns that we discussed over the past two days. Although uh, uh, Mr. Legault and I have been uh, regularly briefing you on our discussions with respect to health care and outcomes for Canadians and how we need to invigorate and revitalize our public health care system by focusing on a new, a new reimagining of how we can meet the needs and expectations of our communities, we also spoke about the challenges of strengthening our supply, our supply chains, uh, bolstering our labour market, addressing climate change of course, uh, enhancing our energy security and food security, as well as struggling with the challenges of mental health and addictions in communities across the land. And lastly, we had a very good discussion led by our territorial leaders on the challenges of Arctic security and Arctic sovereignty. All of these issues uh, are on the table. All of these issues are facing people across the country. And as leaders, it's our obligation to find the best way forward. With respect to affordability and inflation, all of us are coming at this with different perspectives, different approaches, and I think that's the strength of the country historically, and it's certainly the strength of the country today. We have a diverse group of political perspectives here. We have ling linguistic differences. We have backgrounds, cultural backgrounds that are different, and we're able to take all of those differences and celebrate them and, and remember and reflect upon how fortunate we all are to have our Canadian citizenship. But the number one issue for us for the past five years, and in fact, even before uh, I joined the Council of the Federation, is public health care. We see the strains and cracks in communities, whether it be primary care, whether it be acute care, whether it be our long-term care infrastructure. We see new and emerging technologies that are costly and requiring more investments than ever before. We've seen, of course, a rise of awareness and understanding of our need to address and tackle mental health and addictions, as well as, of course, new pharmaceutical and therapeutic solutions that are also costly and require major investments if our citizens are going to benefit from the innovation and the dynamism of, of those working in the healthcare sector. And most importantly, speaking about those people, we remember all of us celebrating every night at 7 o'clock by coming out onto the street and banging pots and sending our gratitude to frontline workers who are going and risking their, themselves and their families to keep the rest of us well. And we, and re, we enjoyed and re, embraced that initiative, but it was symbolic. 
We need now more than symbolism, and that's why we've been calling on the federal government to come and join us, to sit at a table, to talk about these pressing issues, because Canadians expect nothing less from us. And with that, uh, I, I welcome any questions from you, and all of my colleagues are here prepared to answer any issues you want to bring up within the context of those we've discussed, and uh, potentially any others that you believe are relevant to the Council of the Federation. Thank you, Premier. As a reminder to those on the phone line, please press star one to enter the queue. First question, Richard Zussman, Global News. Uh, Premier Horgan, you spent months leading up to this meeting speaking about the importance of health care. You come here and you don't get anywhere on health care. You have a final communique that doesn't even mention health care. And I understand you had information out this morning. How disappointed are you that we're no further ahead now? And I know you spoke to doctors and nurses who proposed a number of things that did not need new money, licensing issues, different payment structures. Where are we at with that, even though you weren't able to get somewhere on money? Well, first of all, we issued a communique this morning on the number one issue. So to suggest that it, uh, we didn't raise public health care in the final communique, I think, is a paper processing issue on your part, not ours. Uh, uh, we were out this morning talking about the results of our discussions yesterday, and if you didn't get a copy, we can certainly get that sent to you. Uh, but we did talk about a range of issues, best practices. Uh, myself uh, and my colleagues have been working in our own communities, working with stakeholders, working with patient groups, working with doctors, uh, social workers, nurse practitioners, registered nurses, the whole continuum of health care providers looking for solutions to the challenges ahead of us. And although there are issues that we can address that don't require in initial investments or additional investments from the federal government, such as licensing, we do in the final communique talk about uh, regulated professions and how we want to see more labor mobility within the country and also with, uh, with those who have credentials, foreign credentials, we want to see those recognized more rapidly and we're working on those strategies all the time. But at the end of the day, what we need to do is infuse uh, some resources into the system so that we can get the outcomes that people want to see. And that is having a national human resource strategy so that we don't find ourselves poaching from each other and uh, outbidding each other to find the healthcare professionals we need to provide services in Canada from coast to coast to coast. That's why we come together. That's why we have a federation so that we can have national standards and national practices. But at the end of the day, the jurisdiction for delivering the services rests with the provinces. And historically, that uh, exchange of responsibilities was we deliver the services and we share the financing of those, of those services at a 50-50 rate. We're now down to about 78% uh, on, the, on the provincial side, 22% on the federal side, and that's just not acceptable. We don't want to quibble about the money. We want to get at the table to talk to the federal government. If they're not acknowledging and recognizing the crisis in communities across the country, they're asleep at the switch, quite frankly, and we invite them to come and talk to us about how we can work together to get the outcomes Canadians deserve. Next question, Binder Sajjan, CTV. Uh, Premier Horgan, just want to ask you, with regards to getting the federal government to the table, it appears that you've fa failed to do that, despite the consensus with the premiers right now. Given the comments that you've heard from federal ministers, do you feel any hope that you're a little bit closer even to getting the federal government to the table? Well, the, uh, I sat down with the Prime Minister last November, and I had just come out of surgery, I was uh, facing uh, 35 rounds of uh, radiation treatment for uh, throat cancer, and I was vulnerable as a, as a human being and as a premier, and the Prime Minister and I had a candid and frank discussion about the importance of making sure that as we go forward, we're working together to address the challenges of patients and those that are accessing our healthcare system. The Prime Minister gave a commitment to me that he would uh, task his ministers to meet with us, and we as a group agreed that we would look at a, a, a diverse group of premiers. Uh, we selected uh, Premier Fury from Newfoundland, who's a surgeon, uh, Premier, Premier Moe from Saskatchewan, who was the past chair of the Council of the Federation, uh, coming from the Prairie, and myself as a representative group of premiers to sit down with the appropriate federal ministers to set the table for a discussion about how we go forward. That was eight months ago. And we started with a meeting in January where we reaffirmed the need to have a face-to-face -face meeting. And after that, it got quiet. We had a couple of phone calls with the Minister of Intergovernmental Relations, and that was it. I got a phone call from that same minister on Sunday morning, Sunday morning, the day we started this conference, asking how things were going. And I gave him a candid response to that question. And here we are. 
Next question, David Cochran, CBC. Hi there, uh, Premier Horgan and, and any other premiers who'd like to answer this. We, uh, Federal Health Minister Duclos was just on Power and Politics and was asked about your request to have a First Minister's meeting. And instead, what he said needs to happen is a conversation about results that would be achieved before you can talk about money. And his view is that that is a conversation that needs to happen at the health minister's level to get that sorted out before you can have a First Minister's meeting to talk about money. So I see some head shaking. I, I wonder if we can get some reaction to that. Well, uh, again, uh, we're not here to be fodder for power and politics, but although it seems to me that the federal government wants to negotiate through your program, so if that's how we're going to roll, I guess we can do that. That's firstly counterproductive, and secondly, again, I use the word disingenuous. Mr. Duclos uh, has had an opportunity to have those discussions with us for eight months. And to now, as we gather here in Victoria to talk about how we go forward, to say, I got an idea, why don't we talk about outcomes? That's what we told them eight months ago. We shared a, a, a basket of initiatives with them and nothing came back. Nothing came back. So with the greatest respect to the federal ministers who are now suggesting that everything is fine, go and talk to human beings. Go and talk to patients. Go and talk to healthcare providers and they'll get a different message. We are echoing what people are telling us in our communities across the country, and I, I welcome my colleagues to respond to this because I feel that uh, uh, I'm holding them back from what they really want to say. Francois, do you want to start? <laughs> Anybody else want to ask? Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, first of all, th thanks for the question. I, I want to start off with uh, thanking uh, Premier Horgan for hosting us. He's been incredible. He's been a credible leader for for BC and the entire country on, on many issues, but especially uh, health care, so, so thank you. You know, I, we, we, it, as, as uh, Premier Horgan said, it's pretty disingenuous uh, when you have the minister come out and say, you know, well, he, here are a few ideas, and by the way, uh, hand it over to your ministers of, of health. It's just one request. Come to the table. Come to the table, start the discussions, uh, we've been asking for this for, for years, all the way back to when I first first got elected. So it's unacceptable, uh, and we need to uh, sit down and, and see the investments. Uh, tell that to the, the, the patient in, in Ontario that's waiting for a hip replacement or a, re, uh, a knee replacement, or as simple as cataracts, or the backlog surgeries that we face every single day right across this great country, uh, from coast to coast to coast. You know, that's what we, we need to talk about. You know, people don't care uh, where the money's coming from. They want action. They don't want to see a backlog uh, of, of surgeries, which which majority of us are, are facing. Come to the table. We'll meet you anywhere, anytime. All 13 of us will put our schedules aside to sit down and start the discussions. But to sit back and, and communicate through the media, it's really insulting to all the people of Canada and insulting to 13 premiers. I would just uh, echo on the results uh, piece in particular. Um, we're, we've been very open that we, there's none of us here who wants worsening results in, in Canadian health care. What we're asking, and I think it's reasonable, and I think it's demanded of Canadians, is an opportunity to use this time of disruption, which I think we can all recognize we're in, to reinvent and reimagine a modern Canadian healthcare system. I think we need to have a mature debate about where that goes, and there's been some commentary about the 22 versus 35 and the calculus surrounding it, but that debate needs to happen at a table. And all of us here today are committed to that table, an open collaborative discussion that Canadians frankly demand and more importantly deserve. I've been on the other side of a gurney. I've had to cancel surgeries. I've been dealing with nurses who have worked 24 hours in a row, seen nurses leave the OR crying because they can't get to a family member's wedding. I've lived it. The time has come, the pandemic has heightened it, but now is the time for all levels of government to work in a collaborative way to modernize the system, to deliver Canadian level, all of which we celebrate around the world, have operated around the world. We are known around the world for our standards of care. We can do it, but we need to do it together. And exchanging rhetoric in the media is, is unfortunate, but we have to come together collaboratively in order to save the Canadian healthcare system. I can go, maybe. Uh, we are here 13 premiers who say the same thing. 
we cannot afford anymore to finance 78% of health care expenses. Health care expenses in Canada right now, it's over $200 billion a year. So what we're asking for is to meet the Prime Minister, that the Premiers meet the Prime Minister. We're not asking that he delegates that to a Minister of Health and our Minister of Health. We need to have a meeting. It's a real problem. It's the most important problem in Canada. So I don't understand why Mr. Trudeau doesn't want to meet us. And it's a bit insulting to send Mr. Leblanc or Mr. Duclos answering our request. And I just, I just want to add, because uh, I think uh, Andrew hit a key point, Everyone in this room and everyone across this country understands that we've been through an unprecedented time in our history, internationally, much less here in Canada. And in a time of disruption, that's when innovation happens. And you don't see that innovation by ignoring opportunity to engage. You, you take advantage of innovation by engaging, and it's completely absent right now. And that's the, that's the tragedy. It's out of sadness, not anger, that we sit here today. We have work to do, we have ideas, the federal government might have some ideas as well. Let's exchange views, let's talk about how we get out of this, making Canada a better place. And that won't happen by exchanging uh, barbs uh, through the media. Next question, please go ahead. Bonjour, Michel Sabat de La Presse Canadienne. D'abord, Monsieur Legault, pourriez-vous répéter cela en français? Yeah, oui. On est actuellement 13 premiers, 13 premiers ministres là, des 13 provinces et territoires qui disons la même chose, qui demandons la même chose. On a besoin d'une rencontre avec le premier ministre du Canada pour discuter du financement de la santé. Actuellement, on dépense plus de 200 milliards de dollars par année dans les différentes provinces pour la santé. Les provinces et territoires paient 78 du 200 milliards. On n'est plus capable de continuer à payer 78 Il me semble que le message est clair, il me semble que le message est important, mais il me semble que M. Trudeau devrait accepter de nous rencontrer. Et c'est un peu insultant de déléguer les messages via M. Duclos, le ministre de la Santé fédérale. D'abord, Comment se fait-il qu'il y ait un ministre de la Santé fédérale alors que c'est un champ de compétences des provinces et des territoires? C'est le premier problème. Mais c'est très insultant que M. Trudeau refuse de rencontrer ses vis-à-vis. -vis. Sorry, next question, please. Beaucoup. Donc, euh, je vais poser ma question euh, en français, mais euh, Mr. Organ, I would like to, you to answer it also in English. Donc, euh, euh, M. Euh, Kenny nous a dit tantôt en français que l'Alberta serait absolument prête à offrir la garantie de ne pas réduire ses dépenses en santé en échange d'un financement si c'est une condition du fédéral. Donc, j'aimerais savoir si d'autres provinces, y compris le Québec, sont prêtes à donner des garanties ou accepter certaines conditions euh, pour le fédéral. Bien, on l'a dit, puis un des problèmes qu'on vit, c'est qu'actuellement, les dépenses en santé augmentent de 5 à 6 par année, même si on veut offrir le même niveau de service à cause de l'impact du vieillissement de la population, pas à cause des nouvelles technologies. Donc, je ne pense pas qu'il n'y a personne ici là, qui veut réduire les dépenses de santé. Il faut continuer de les augmenter. On s'est fait aider depuis trois ans par le gouvernement fédéral avec des dépenses non récurrentes. Mais que fait-on dans les prochaines années si on n'a pas l'argent de, du gouvernement fédéral. C'est ça, là, qui est la question. Ellie, from the Toronto Star. Uh, my question is for Premier Doug Ford. Um, you came here looking for some consensus and support on the issue of immigration, especially as it relates to the labor shortage. How did the discussions go, and do you feel you got the support you were seeking? Is the statement that's been put out, is it strong enough? Thank, thank you for the question. There, there was a consensus. And do you know what's amazing? You, you see
we're short uh, 378,000 uh, jobs right, right here to be filled by these companies that are in desperate need. When I was on the campaign trail, I, I went from one end of our province to the other, and the number one sign I saw, not election signs, it was help wanted signs in small businesses, medium businesses, large businesses, and uh, all you have to do is, is go to a restaurant, and uh, you, you ask the owner of the restaurant, they're short staff, ask your own employer. Uh, every company out there needs people. So we're willing to help the federal government, but we need their help right now. Next question, please go ahead. Veronique Prince, Radio-Canada. I question for Mr. Legault. What if other premiers want to answer after that? They can. Um, par rapport à l'entrevue de Dominique Leblanc euh, qu'il a accordé à Power and Politics, euh, il fait référence aux faits, euh, aux, aux chèques finalement qui ont été remis aux Québécois en disant euh, si on transfère de l'argent, il ne faudrait pas que les provinces réduisent leur financement en santé et en quelque sorte détournent l'argent, la mettent ailleurs. Est-ce que vous êtes senti visible? Comment avez-vous euh, réagi? Là? Bon. D'abord, c'est tentant de dire on va répondre aux commentaires du premier ministre, pas de ses ministres, mais bon. Euh, Rappelons-nous que le 500 dollars qu'on a donné aux Québécois, c'est un montant ponctuel non récurrent. Là, on parle de payer pour des infirmières, embaucher du personnel de façon récurrente. Donc, je ne sais pas si M. Leblanc fait exprès ou s'il ne comprend pas, mais il y a une différence entre un montant ponctuel non récurrent puis des besoins d'augmenter les transferts en santé de façon récurrente à long terme pour, entre autres, financer de la main d'œuvre. Donc, je pense qu'on mélange deux choses, là, actuellement. Je pense que M. Leblanc comprend très bien que ça n'a rien à voir, euh, le commentaire sur les versements ponctuels. Puis, n'oublions pas que, de façon générale, le Québec, au Québec, les Québécois payent plus d'impôts que dans les autres provinces, là, donc il faut aussi tenir compte de ça. Et, et moi, je dirais qu'il y a deux, deux urgences au Canada maintenant. L'urgence euh, de l'inflation, le coût de vie, et deuxièmement, l'urgence dans le système de santé. Il faut que les gouvernements s'adressent les deux urgences. Et ça, c'est euh, euh, une demande du de grand public. C'est ce que nous faisons. Chacun dans notre propre voie, nous avons les politiques particulières pour s'adresser le coût de vie. En Alberta, on a laissé tomber le, le taxe sur l'essence. Mais euh, en même temps, on a, on a augmenté 2 milliards de dollars au budget de santé. Puis, euh, comme euh, François a dit, euh, nous espérons que les crises de coûts de vie et de l'inflation, c'est quelque chose d'à court terme. Mais euh, évidemment, les crises dans le système de santé des capacités qui a, qui a été révélée pendant la pandémie est quelque chose à long terme. Et je ne, sais, je ne comprends pas pourquoi Ottawa ne peut pas s'adresser avec nous autres les deux crises. Just in English, I would say the question was about uh, Mr. Uh, Le, Minister LeBlanc saying uh, we uh, provinces are addressing cost of living issues. That means they're wasting money not putting it on health care, but there are in fact two crises, uh, major crises and priorities in the country right now, inflation and the cost of living and health care capacity. And as leaders, we have to address both. That's what we're all trying to do in our own ways. In Alberta, we've done it by dropping the fuel tax, but also on the other side for health care, increasing the budget there by $2 billion. We all hope the inflation crisis is a short-term one. The uh, health care capacity crisis is a long-term one. And the federal government simply has to be part of the solution. Yeah, and, and I would add to, to uh, Francois and Jason's comments that that we're talking about long-term, sustainable, predictable funding so we can build out the infrastructure that's needed in terms of our post-secondary institutions to train the next generation of healthcare workers, ensuring that we have uh, access through immigration. Like, all of the questions that are coming really come back to the one thing, providing services for Canadians. And if we're, able, if we're going to do that, we can't do it with one-time funding. Uh, the issues around inflation and, and, and fuel prices and the impacts on, on pocketbooks are issues that we hope, as, as Jason said, are temporary. The challenges in health care are going to be long term, and we need to start working on it right away with a plan that doesn't just have one-off funding, which is the preferred model for the federal government, but a sustained funding over time so that we can build out that infrastructure, which includes, of course, people to provide services to other Canadians. Next question, please go ahead. Bonjour, Nicolas Lachange, Journal de Québec, Journal de Montréal. 
Monsieur Legault, une question, mais pour vous, mais ça pourrait être aussi pour euh, vos euh, homologues. Euh, Monsieur Kenney a présenté tout à l'heure une proposition sur le libre-échange euh, qui semble aller beaucoup plus loin que ce qui est présenté dans le communiqué actuel. Euh, Qu'est-ce que vous pensez de cette proposition-là, notamment sur les, euh, les reconnaissances professionnelles? On est tous d'accord, les premiers ministres des provinces et des territoires, pour faciliter les échanges entre les provinces. On voit par exemple avec les États-Unis, qu'il y a de plus en plus de protectionnisme aux États-Unis. Donc, c'est une raison additionnelle pour que les provinces et les territoires facilitent les échanges commerciaux, facilitent aussi la reconnaissance des acquis pour les personnes qui euh, changent de province ou de territoire. Donc, on est tous d'accord qu'il faut en faire plus de ce côté-là. Étant donné que j'ai été pensionnaire dans la question, je souligne que dans la déclaration, dans le communiqué, il y a un engagement pour accélérer la reconnaissance des titres professionnels partout au pays. Nous l'avons fait dernièrement avec une nouvelle loi sur euh, euh, la main d'œuvre qui reconnaît effectivement euh, sur le champ les, les, euh, les titres professionnels des Canadiens qui déménagent, déménagent en Alberta. Mais deuxièmement, je suis très, euh, très reconnaissant que tous les premiers ministres étaient d'accord pour donner une direction à la table de concertation sur la réglementation de la fédération pour accélérer le travail, pour développer un, un modèle potentiel, je traduis, pour reconnaissance mutuelle des réglementations avec une option d'une liste euh, négative. Ça, c'est exactement ce que j'ai proposé euh, dans la conférence de presse. C'est ce que nous avons lancé avec l'étude. Euh, et euh, j'aimerais euh, remercier tous euh, les premiers ministres d'être euh, euh, d'accord à cet égard. Brenna Owen, CP. Thank you. Um, this question, I think, was touched on in French, and I'll direct it towards Premier Horgan, but if anyone else would like to add, Um, Premier Horgan, you said earlier today that any health transfer money would go into a pot and it's the province's jurisdiction to figure out where that goes to support public services. And I'm wondering, what if the so-called conditions that we've been hearing about from the federal government relate to spending the money specifically on health care, some of the priorities that you've identified? What is your understanding of the possible conditions, and are you concerned that that's a sticking point in coming to the table? Well, thank you for the question, and uh, this, is, this is the challenge. If we have to engage with our federal counterparts through uh, media interviews, uh, I've written to the Prime Minister in uh, December, uh, no response. Uh, we sent a, a package of principles that we felt we would guide a discussion, no response. And now it's, well, we want you to spend it on specific things. And we're fine with that. And what we all agree on is that there are a range of issues that are affecting the health care delivery across the country, but there's different nuances and emphasis depending on where you live. Demographics have a lot to do with it. For example, uh, where you have aging populations, long-term care is a higher priority uh, than uh, primary care might be. And, and so in Alberta, where there's a younger population, the needs of the health care system are different than they would be in British Columbia or other provinces that have aging populations. So the, the whole point of us being responsible, our jurisdiction to deliver the services is, we're better placed to make those choices based on the needs of the communities that we represent. Therefore, uh, we've had historically a transfer of resources from Ottawa, which we then distribute within our health care budgets. And, and I don't want people to, uh, or I don't, certainly don't want the federal government to take a clip from a news conference and say, see, they're going to use the money for something else. We get money in and we send money out to provide services for people. And the number one cost driver for our budgets, the number one issue for our citizens, is the delivery of health care services. So it, there's no debate about what we would do with a health care transfer, except what the emphasis would be province by province by province by territory. And that depends on what the circumstances are, whether you have a, 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 a sufficient number of primary care providers or you need more acute care providers, or it's another infrastructure piece that you want to invest in. We believe that we have the responsibility to make those decisions. We believe the federal government has a responsibility. If we have a national program guided by the Canada Health Act, then they certainly should sit down with us and we should engage with how we best deliver those services for the citizens that we all represent. 
I would just add that uh, Premier Horgan's done a, an incredible job of communicating this as well. Uh, and I think it's important to understand, and I think Canadians understand that, uh, that that's a bit of a false equivalence, uh, especially around uh, when forcing a choice between cost of living and health care. The next thing will be health care versus pavement. Uh, that, that's a false equivalent. Uh, all, we just want to get to the table to talk about the funding, to move beyond the conceptual framework into a more substantive discussion collaboratively with our federal partners uh, to achieve these goals. And I just would reiterate, there's none amongst us who wants outcomes in healthcare to worsen. We are committed to improving the system. We're committed to improving outcomes and results for patients across the country. And so I don't really see a big gap there, but I do see a, a debate developing that I do believe is false. Next question, Andrea Wu, Globe and Mail. Hi there. So Ottawa has indicated that it wants to see some accountability for any additional funds, that Canadians want to know how this money is going to be spent. Premier Horgan, in your remarks this morning, you said that provinces and territories are accountable every day through their legislatures that the federal government is creating a problem that doesn't exist. But during the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw an Auditor General in Alberta saying that because of poor record keeping, we have $4 billion meant for COVID-19 initiatives. Uh, and we don't know what that actually achieved. In Ontario, $210 million that was meant to go to small businesses went to those that were not qualified. How did the premiers respond to that? Well, I'll start, and I'll certainly let the premiers that you identified uh, take, a, take a stab at it as well. We are accountable to the citizens that we represent. The federal government is not a superior order of government. It's not a better order of government. It's an equal order of government. And uh, we'll take no lessons from the federal government in fiscal probity. Uh, I mean, I, I think there's a, an issue or two over time uh, that Auditor Generals in Ottawa have highlighted or the Parliamentary Budget Officer have suggested uh, were uh, a grotesque or egregious expenditures. So uh, point made, uh, federal government, if you think that you're somehow superior to us in terms of our ability to manage these issues. But none of that matters to the people who are waiting for a hip replacement. None of that matters to the people who are in a hallway because the ERs are crammed because there are not enough staff to move people through. None of that matters. None of that matters if you are on a cancer wait list and you can't get access to the chemotherapy or the radiation you need. So it's all, again, well and good for people to sit in Ottawa uh, 3,000 miles from where we are today and suggest that they somehow are superior in managing the finances of the country than we are in managing the finances of our provinces. We are accountable every day to the people who elect us, and they are the ones that make a determination about our effectiveness or lack of effectiveness on election day. And that is the ultimate accountability. The federal government is in Ottawa telling us that we are not doing a good enough job, but they're also saying we don't need any more resources because there's plenty in the system. You can't be both of those things at the same time, and we need to sit down and stop talking between uh, this table and the federal government through all of you good people who have come here to, to transcribe our words and send images across the country. Canadians don't want that. They want us as adults to sit down and figure out how we deliver the services that they demand. And of course, they pay for it. The money in Ottawa isn't Ottawa's money, it's Canadians' money. And guess what? It doesn't come from Ottawa, it comes from provinces. We're asking for some of it back to provide the services that Canadians expect us to deliver. And I'll let Doug and uh, well, Jason, take on yeah, thanks. there. Thanks. Uh, first of all, uh, every dime of what we spent on extraordinary uh, investments during the pandemic was for public health. And all of that is obvious, um, just like every other province, all of that uh, in due, due course will be fully uh, public and review, can be reviewed by the legislature, the public auditors and others. But it's true that in the midst of the pandemic, uh, I, like I'm sure every other government, our focus was just responding in real time to the emergency and not uh, clearing through mountains of paperwork. We, um, there's no doubt about it, we, we cut the normal uh, corners on procurement because there were days, remember we were on, on calls as a, as a group early on when provinces were, day, were days from running out of critical equipment. So we were all doing whatever it took uh, to get uh, warehouses filled with ventilators and uh, PPE um, to get uh, additional medical supplies, medication, and uh, and and, 
everything that was required all across the system, all of that will become evident. We certainly have the same kind of generally accepted accounting principles as all uh, governments do, all of it fully transparent, re reported to the legislature, reported to the public. We've actually increased funding for the Alberta Health Quality Council, um, which measures uh, health outcomes. We brought in Ernst & Young to do a performance review of Alberta Health Services uh, to find efficiencies and so forth. Uh, and I don't have any objection to sharing all of that and more with the Government of Canada. I think that's actually quite reasonable. And, and in the last Health Accord 2005, there was a reporting obligation for provinces to report back. I think that's, that's quite reasonable. But how do we know that that's what they want when they've never actually sat down and said it to us? We will take one more question in the room. Shannon Waters, BC Today. <laughs> Don't get to do that very often. <laughs> Thank you, Tara. Um, I'll direct my question to Premier Horgan, but if any of the other Premiers want to chime in, feel free. Um, you've mentioned a couple of times in these past couple of days the need for a national framework to prevent provinces from having to compete with each other, from poaching from each other when it comes to recruiting and retaining healthcare professionals. And I'm hoping you can provide some details on what that looks like. Presumably, training and recruitment would be priorities there. But I'm curious as to whether that also involves a triage system or prioritizing staffing needs? And so is that something you have some specific ideas on at this point, or is it just an issue you've identified that needs to be discussed with Ottawa at this time? It's the latter. Uh, we, we have been appealing to the federal government to sit down with us so that we can establish frameworks for engagement uh, across the country uh, from coast to coast to coast. Uh, we need to do that so we can all have comfort that we're, I mean, all of us uh, have been in unison on this question for at least the five years I've been here. Sandy's been here for six. And uh, this was the issue when I arrived and it's the issue as I, as I leave. Uh, and the federal government has refused to come and sit down with us and engage with us about what they believe the best way forward is beyond uh, power and politics. And so if that's, if that's the state of our federation, then I'm not as optimistic as I was when I got up this morning. I'd like to think that as we look at the challenges that we all face in this unprecedented time, I, I, I think we need to hearken back to that. Uh, as Jason said, uh, uh, 24 months ago, we were collaborating in an unprecedented way. What Ontario required, the rest of the country was uh, working to make sure that we could deliver. Uh, I know that one, uh, Jason uh, in, in Alberta had a backlog of uh, personal protective equipment that we Sur were able surplus. to distribute across Sur surplus, not a, backlog, like surplus. a surplus of, of uh, materials that, that he uh, welcomed the, the rest of us to access. Um, uh, Premier Fury and his spouse traveled to Ottawa as physicians to help out. I mean, there was unprecedented collaboration and the federal government was right there. And we applauded that engagement. It was an unprecedented time for all Canadians, but it was also an unprecedented time in our federation. And now, uh, eight months later, we're exchanging notes uh, through the media. I, 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 you know, where'd the love go? You know, I mean, everything was so fine and then it wasn't. I mean, this is, it, it's, it's vexing that we could have made so much progress together. And now when we, we all recognize that the cracks in our precious healthcare system are there for all to see, most importantly, our citizens who want services. When we turn to our partners, our allies, and say, hey, let's get together and figure this out. They go, no, you got enough, or you're gonna waste it, or uh, maybe we can't talk to you right now, there's something else going on. What could be more important for the intergovernmental relations minister than to relate with the other governments of Canada? Is there anything else on his docket beyond the uh, 13 of us? I wouldn't think so, but here we are. I'd just like to specifically comment on the question uh, with respect to mobility across jurisdictions. I think that, uh, as we've said many times here today, this moment of disruption caused by the pandemic creates an opportunity to look at the practice of medicine very differently. And we know new generations like to practice differently than old. The old paradigm of hanging a shingle and being the only physician or nurse in a community, that's just not gonna fly anymore. And the longer we hold on to the, that romantic notion, the harder it is gonna be for the system and more importantly for patients. So when looking at mobility across jurisdictions, I think it's a creative way to unlock uh, new potential of employment, uh, new potential of service across the country. Because I know there's uh, barriers when uh, you're a physician, for example, to practice in other areas. 
be very cool and interesting to do a locum in BC, you know, and practice, do some total hips in, in British Columbia, but there are barriers to that, significant barriers. And so if we look at a national strategy and to eliminate those barriers and allow physicians and nurses to cross jurisdictions, I think that's a creative way in, in, in using that in combination with new technologies that we've harnessed during the pandemic to provide services, especially to our rural communities. So I think that this is an opportunity, one that can't be lost in the rhetoric that uh, unfortunately seems to be evolving. Can I just add, uh, John, uh, I, I, I take my time back to uh, being a staffer working for Premier Bins when the Council of the Federation began. And at that time, premiers were meeting, trying to get a meeting with the Prime Minister to talk about more money for health care. So we all understand, I've talked to many of you, uh, we all understand that there's a certain frustrating uh, romantic dance in this whole thing, but I, I do feel that the factors are different now. Uh, it, it's changed, that like we're in a situation that we can't go on with this silly back and forth. Uh, I'll talk to the media, you say this, I say that, we'll frustrate the premiers, the premiers will respond and we'll do this silly dance. The factors have changed so much that we need to put aside the silliness and, and as we did through COVID, I mean, we had 26 or 27 meetings with the Prime Minister, we talked weekly almost uh, to get through a situation of challenge that the country needed us to come together to do. We're in that now with the overall delivery of health care. And I think it's, it's incumbent upon all of us, it's incumbent upon our colleagues in Ottawa to put aside some of that silliness. Let, let's not let that be the norm again. Let's get back to do what uh, islanders in, 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 in my province and, and Canadians across the country want us to do, is let's get some solutions to some of these challenges. Why do we want to mess around with this little dance? Let's, let's get the work done. And that's, I think that's why you're hearing the frustration uh, from, from this table. But uh, I think, you know, Canadians are, are I'm, I'm assuming, quite frustrated with it as well. I would like to add something to this conversation in relation to the, the people and the nurses and the health professionals that are in the hospitals. Um, Premier Fiore can talk directly about the surgeon and, and the family physicians and, and what that means and how in, innovation has to change in the system. But we met, we met uh, this week with all of the nurses, with the nurses union across the country. And you know, we've heard many stories about 24-hour shifts and, and the concerns about being in the ERs and safety. <clears throat> I think the opportunity is how do we address those concerns that are every day? Simple things like, like uh, the scheduling, you know, like they, they're getting burned out. They can't even have flexibility in the scheduling. I think there's, a, there's, there's, there's money needed to have a continuation and a better healthcare system, but there's also an opportunity to engage employees right in the front lines in the hospitals that are delivering the service. Nurses are, are saying we need more nurses. Yes, we do. But we need innovation. We need better health care that's delivered every day by the people that know it best. And I think it's time we listen to those people and got their, got their information firsthand of how we can change. And when we talk about um, interaction between provinces, it's where, is, where are our best practices and how do we not duplicate services, but how do we complement services? And I know during COVID in New Brunswick, we have, we have two health care systems, Vitality and Horizon. But they, we work together like never before to deliver health care in the province. And we learned that we can do that better together than we could as two independent. So yes, we have two systems, but they can complement each other in their service delivery. And I think what we're seeing is we can broaden that between provinces. And we've had that discussion in Atlantic Canada. So the opportunity for us to be better at what we do is all part and parcel to more money to help us there. But we can deliver a better result with people being part of that solution. We will now go to the phone lines. First question, Dylan Robertson, Winnipeg Free Press. Uh, Premier Corgan, you're coming away from this summit with no visible movement from Ottawa on the health transfer. If anything, there's been more pushback from Ottawa now since your initial demand in 2020, and you don't seem to have a lot of leverage. Ottawa says that there needs to be strings attached to the money that it's giving, but your statements today don't show an openness to conditions, and you actually compared that this morning to a surf relationship. So I'm curious to know if you feel that this strategy is working if you're coming away from the summit arguably further behind than for a week ago, and also if Premier Stephenson would like to weigh in on this. Well, I'll, I'll start, and, and, and Doug and Heather can, can follow. 
Uh, in, ter in terms of leverage, this, is, this isn't a wrestling match. This, is, this isn't a battle of titans. This is partners collaborating to deliver services for our fellow citizens. This is not, uh, this is not a one-upmanship effort here. This is about, let's get together. We've got a whole bunch of people here that are delivering services in different and diverse communities. We have different political perspectives uh, that, uh, again, uh, we're, we're sitting down together to figure out how do we go forward. And we're looking to our ally, our partner in Ottawa saying, hey, how about it? And we get back this, well, you know, we're just not prepared until there's conditions. What conditions? Tell us what these conditions are. Well, you won't give uh, tax cuts to your citizens. Well, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We have multiple uh, responsibilities within our jurisdictions. And the primary one is delivering healthcare services. But we still have to keep, uh, in BC, the, the ferries have to keep running. Uh, the, uh, the highways keep, have to be maintained. The schools need to be populated and built. And all of the other things that we do in, a, in our society to be one of the most uh, desirable places on the planet to be. It's not about, uh, well, if you don't do it our way, it's not going to happen. We need collaboration, cooperation, and that's what we've been doing. Uh, for five years, and the federal government just needs to join us. And if they have ideas, and, and they involve uh, conditions, if they involve best practices, if they involve any number of things, happy to have the conversation. We sent, uh, uh, at their request, a series of initiatives that we wanted to pursue, and we got zero back. I, I don't know what to say about that. You can't, we can't negotiate with ourselves. Someone asked me the other day, well, I want to know specifically what you're going to do with the money. I said, well, why would I engage in that when I just need to deal with the money I have and the services that I need to deliver? When we get to a place where we're talking about how we're going to distribute the money, we can have a discussion about where it's going to be spent, but it's counterproductive to say, before I give you anything, you need to tell me exactly what you're going to do with it, because this is a dynamic situation we're in, and it always has been and it always will be. And it wasn't a problem in the past for Canada to say, as they did in 2004, let's figure out a way forward. And they tried to do again uh, in the last decade. It is 2022. People are living longer. Services are getting better. We're more sophisticated and more innovative in the delivery of healthcare services. And that costs more money. This is not uh, Mayberry anymore. We're not in Kansas anymore. It's Canada 2022. We have a publicly funded healthcare system that needs an injection of cash, and we need to talk about how we do that. Come onto the table, Ottawa, and we're happy to do that. Just, just briefly, uh, Dylan. Thanks for the, thanks for the question. And you know, this is, and you and I have talked about this before. This is the number one issue, uh, one of the most important issues across the country right now. And uh, all we're asking for is for the federal government to come to the table. We're not afraid of things like accountability uh, to our citizens. We do that every day. We're accountable every day, and that's been mentioned here today. We're not afraid of getting better results. We want to get better results uh, for Canadians when it comes to health care. And so those are the issues that they seem to be uh, talking about as reasons that they don't want to sit down with us at the table. And to me, I just think that's really disappointing. I think Canadians really want us to be working together in different levels of government, taking a more collaborative approach to these things. And I can just say, just quite honestly, from my perspective and, and, and from Manitobans, that's very disappointing. They want to see us working together. I hope that they will put whatever it is aside, just come to the table so we can start to have those discussions. <laughs> And I just want to intervene and say, um, I'm not afraid of accountability. I'm from the Northwest Territories. We're not afraid of accountability. We have open books. We get audits all the time. Come and see what we're spending our money. But the needs of each jurisdiction are different. Canada is diverse, and we're well known for that, and, and appreciated worldwide for that diversity. In the Northwest Territories, if, if all of the money was to go, for example, into long-term care, we care about our elders and our seniors dearly. But we have communities in the Northwest Territories because of the short staffing, we don't have a health center. We've closed down the medical care facility in communities. Could you imagine living in a hometown and if you have an emergency, something happens to your child, to your parent, to yourself, that you can't even get a service? So that is what we're talking about. We need the flexibility. We're, I'm willing to show you where we spend our money. But don't tell me that I have to spend it all in long-term care when I don't even have a doctor and a nurse. 
in our communities. So every jurisdiction is different. We all have different needs and we're all accountable. There's not one of us that doesn't have to open our books. But the point is, is that if, if you're not even at the table and talking to us, then you can't even hear those concerns. And all we're asking for is come to the table, hear our concerns, work with us. Thank you. Thank you, and I guess what I'd say is I think you're saying it's, it's pretty unanimous here. You couldn't, there's not, a, there's not a community in this country that you could go to and stop somebody on the street and ask them what they think of the state of healthcare. You get the same answer in every single community. We have a lot of work to do in healthcare. And uh, all, all, the only thing we're asking for is, is the federal government to come and talk to us about it. And if they don't want to do that um, because they're afraid it's going to cost them money, well, then there's, there's, there's a lot of big issues to, that we need to, to get through, uh, starting right there. But I mean, if they want to ask us, uh, well, what are the outcomes we're, we're focusing on? I can tell you right now, um, in, in Nova Scotia, there's, there's nurses being called in from vacation because they're needed on the floor. Uh, those are the outcomes we want to fix. That's what we want to talk to the federal government about. If they want to talk to uh, what, are, what are the outcomes that we're going to address, you know, um, you know, we've shared stories today about uh, emergency room physicians who are just burnt out and exhausted and are afraid they're going to make a mistake at work because they're tired. They need help. They need our support. Those are the outcomes that we want to address. And we just want to talk to the federal government about it. I can tell you uh, there's nobody up here who's trying to scrimp on a health care budget and divert money somewhere else. That's not happening. Uh, so, uh, we're, of course, uh, we, we want to spend the money on health care. Of course, we want to spend the money to improve uh, outcomes. The only thing uh, that is stopping that uh, progress on that is the federal government's willingness to just sit down and talk to us. That's all we're asking for. I mean, it's really not, a, it's really not meant to be a, a controversial ask. Just come and talk to us. There's lots of stuff we can do together. We want to do that. You know, I, I think uh, over the last couple of years, the challenges everyone's gone through worldwide, across Canada, um, and as, as Canadians, we all pitched in. We all worked uh, hand in hand with each other. Um, you know, the, the provinces all helped out. And, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Fury sent uh, his lovely wife, Allison, over to Ontario to help us out in a, in a desperate need. But every, everyone pitched in. And uh, you keep hearing the word uh, collaboration and, and cooperation. That, that's all we're asking for. You know, we, we all have a, a, a great relationship. I'll, I'll speak for myself. I have a phenomenal uh, relationship with the, the, the Deputy Prime Minister. I think the world of Christia uh, have a phenomenal relationship with Minister LeBlanc. Uh, you know, as, as the, the Premier's heard, heard me say, I think he's, he's great. I, I must have said it three or four times in, in our meetings over the last few days. But that's what's bothersome. You know, we, we need to sit down. Canadians expect it. Uh, they expect us to work together. As I said earlier on, they don't care where the money's coming from, but the burnt out nurse that's working around the clock, you know, 24 hour shifts, um, you know, they need, they need the help from the province and the feds. When the doctors are being burnt out, they need the help. When we're hiring more nurses, and Ontario hired over 10,000 healthcare workers since the pandemic. We, we created 3,100 more beds. We put 40 billion dollars into infrastructure, into new hospitals, 50 new hospitals and, and expansions uh, right across this province. But it's not sustainable. Even as the largest province, we cannot continue at the pace we're going without the support of the federal government. And it, it, you're, you're hearing the same tone from everyone. Just come to the table. It's not, uh, you know, you against us. Uh, it's all the same taxpayer. There's going to be accountability at all levels, and uh, we just need your help. So we're asking to come to the table, and uh, we'll, we'll work with you. And that's the only way you get things done. Not going through the, the media, and I say that respectfully to the media because you're doing the job you have to do, uh, come to the table. John, I'd just, uh, I'd just add to that as to the... Uh Something Andrew had said uh, a few minutes ago around the, the missed opportunity that we uh, that, that we are or that Canadians are missing uh, by 
essentially the federal government not coming to the table, having the conversation with the 13 individuals that, uh, that you see in front of you here uh, today. And I would use an example as we found our way through the, uh, the last couple of years and through our, our Canadian experience of what was a, a global pandemic. We met weekly, uh, us 13, uh, the 13 premiers, or maybe it was a little different variation of us uh, during that period of time, but we met weekly uh, for uh, much of that time. And we met either weekly or bi-weekly as well with the, uh, the Prime Minister and and the Deputy Prime Minister often was on uh, those calls as well. And uh, we, we had put together, uh, you know, a partnership re funding agreement, a partnership support agreement being the, the safe restart agreement. It went far beyond uh, health care, what was, what was, but was based in supporting Canadians through what was a, a very challenging time. We saw the federal government procure vaccines. We saw the, the provincial and territorial health systems actually uh, deliver those vaccines to Canadians. We saw the Canadian government procuring um, uh, pr uh, PPE equipment. Uh, we saw the provincial uh, entities actually then uh, dispersing that, that equipment to Canadians. We saw testing facilities uh, pop up across, uh, provincially and territorially operated testing facilities pop up across this nation. Yes, there was some financial support from the federal government so that we could provide the services that Canadians needed over what was a very, very challenging time for, uh, for all of us uh, on, on earth, I would say. But in addition to that, we saw additional federal funding that was provided and then added to by the provinces for schools, for example. In Saskatchewan, our, we had $75 million, I believe, came from the federal government. We added another $80 million to that and provided that to our school divisions in the province to ensure uh, that they had the funds to keep our children as safe as possible through this very challenging challenging time. The municipalities that were, uh, you know, running their, their transportation systems at maybe 25 or 30 percent of, the, of the, uh, the, the rate that they normally would, uh, the federal government, yes, did provide some dollars. In our case, about $70 million that we flowed through to municipalities, and we added $150 million uh, to that to keep our municipalities as funded as possible through what was a very challenging time uh, from, their, uh, from their desk as well. Um, I would say that that relationship and that agreement and, and that discussion that we had over 20 or 25 meetings, I suspect, 36, uh, 36 meetings, I'm correct, I stand corrected by the current chair, um, is really an example for us uh, to come together once again and to actually have a, a, a very fulsome conversation, not only about how uh, we're going to support Canadians from a healthcare perspective in, into the decades ahead, um, and, and quite frankly, the provinces aren't going to be able to do that when they're funding 78% and likely that percentage increasing in the years ahead, um, but we're going to miss out on the opportunity that, that Andrew had alluded to um, with respect to how we are going to shift and change this health care system that uh, needs to look quite different in the future. The last significant increase we had in the, in the Canada health transfer was some 30 years ago. You think of uh, the health care system we have today and what we're asking it to address and how we're asking it to service Canadians today versus 30 years ago and you think about what we need to do in the decades ahead. And most certainly, uh, this is an opportunity, and I, I think Canadians should be disappointed that this is an opportunity that, as, as it stands today, the federal government is, is missing out on participating in. I'm just going to add a bit here, too, uh, if that's okay, John. Um, you know, I've been here six years now, the longest uh, standing current uh, premier, and uh, I've never seen this table so sophisticated in, uh, in all of my time. The conversations that have brought us together during the pandemic, uh, the conversation about mental wellness and substance abuse that all of us did with the Promising Practices podcast, uh, the conversations that we've had with every ju jurisdiction, what work we're trying to do to modernize health care in our, in, our, in our communities. And I tell you, when we were in the, in the pandemic, when we told Canadians, hope is on the way, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, vaccines are coming, there, you know, there's, there's going to be better times ahead. It's that hope that really did help a lot of people to say, we're going to dig down a little bit more and we're going we're to bear down. And what we're seeing right now is uh, nurses and doctors in ERs that are, are, are afraid that they're going to hurt themselves or their patients, and they're looking for us to find solutions and to come together and to share all this information together. And we've been told to begin with, uh, wait till COVID is, you know, no longer such a big issue. Wait in between the two elections of the big uh, provinces. We, we've been told a few different times uh, what to wait for. 
we need a date. We need to know exactly when we can get to that table. Uh, the nurses are ready. Uh, we met with them uh, this week, and uh, they talked about how they would love to be at that table as well. Uh, Dr. Catherine Smart, uh, the uh, president of the Canadian Medical Association from Whitehorse, met with us as well. They're ready to come down and talk about best practices. They're ready to talk about what we could do to modernize this system. We need the federal government to tell us when we're going to have this conversation and give some hope to people that are on their last strings right now. Thank you. Last question today, Camille Baines, Canadian Press. Hi, I'd like to know if there were any discussions on uh, how limited resources, even if it's 35% from the feds, could be stretched to benefit multiple jurisdictions. So if you have uh, a specialist who treats a rare disease, could that person not be doing virtual appointments in different provinces? Well, that, that's a very good question, and that's the type of innovation that is happening now uh, amongst uh, the deliverers of the service. And we can enhance that by having, again, a national discussion and dialogue with the federal government about how we uh, further advance those types of initiatives. We, we don't need to uh, recreate wheels. Uh, the Romano Commission, some how many years ago was that? A long time ago laid the foundations of what the expectations were then. We don't need to go back to that. What we need to do is find better ways to deliver the services that people expect. And with innovation in the sector, whether it be uh, pharmaceuticals therapy, uh, and other therapeutics, whether it be uh, uh, new technologies, uh, whether it be diagnostic or, or otherwise, it, it's how do we collaborate across the country as we did through the pandemic? How do we do that going forward? And to do that, we believe we need uh, to have a partner, uh, an equal partner in the federal government, which has been the foundation of the, uh, the uh, delivering health care in Canada since the 1960s. And again, it, it, is, it separates us from our, our cousins to the south. Uh, we are the envy of North America because of what we have. I talked to Governor Jay Inslee, uh, my colleague uh, to the south of us in Washington State, and uh, he, would, he would love to have a system where anyone who is, needs health care can get health care without checking with their banker first. These are things that we take for granted in Canada, but we need to, we need to remind ourselves how precious this is, and we need to put care and attention towards making sure it will be here for us a decade from now and two decades from now. I don't know if anyone else wants to add. Yeah, just at the risk of sounding really re uh, repetitive, um, now is the time during this time of disruption. Uh, I used to see, for example, patients from across Newfoundland and Labrador travel eight hours for a two-minute appointment. I think that the pandemic has shown that, you know, you could probably do that, that visit virtually. But that, that requires, what you're describing requires an investment in technology, an investment in broadband. It involves in a, a structural change in how we license uh, physicians and nurses across the, pro across the country. And it but more importantly, it really unlocks the value across this table. It locks the, the collaborative value here, but it also locks the, unlocks the value of medical professionals. And I practice around the world that is the strongest here in Canada. And I think despite some of the, the conversations here today, there is a significant amount of hope and optimism for a modern system that is sustainable and one that addresses the permanent needs of Canadians long term. But this is a generational opportunity right now. We all recognize it, and I hope the federal government does too. Okay, if we can everybody just uh, get just face forward, we'll take one quick picture. Wonderful. That's all the time we have. Thanks for joining us today. And just, be, just before you all go, for those of you who've come from away to Victoria, I want to thank you for coming. Uh, and if the federal government needs any uh, encouragement, I'll just say that uh, we in British Columbia know that the weather is a federal responsibility. So I want to thank the Prime Minister for the past few days. It's been outstanding. And uh, best of luck to you all. Salut. Uh, safe travels home.